How to be an artist. Step 20. A community of healing. With guest Dave DeRocher. Yeah, maybe a good place to start would be for me to kind of explain my, my, my experience kind of finding out about the Other Side Academy. Um, okay. So my first experience was, uh, you know, what my wife and I did a move a few years back. And we, we hired Other Side Academy to do the move. Yeah. And, you know, it was just, it was done mm-hmm. in like a, an hour and a half or something like that, you know, like mm-hmm. just this amazingly fast, you know, move time, which was awesome. But the thing that like really impressed me was just like, there was this sense of camaraderie with, with the movers, like giving each other high fives and like slap each other on the back when they were finished. And it was like, it was enviable, you know, it was like, yeah. I wish I could have had, I think of all times in my life where I've worked different places and like, ah, I, w- I want something like that when I'm working at doing a day's work, you know, just taking pride in your work and, and, uh, having some sort of respect for that. Um, and then, you know, didn't think too much about it. And then I read, read David Brooks's, uh, article about nuclear family where he kind yeah. of mentions other side Academy at the end. And I was like, oh yeah, I remember this. And I, and I suddenly recalled like, oh yeah, Delancey street. I'd heard of this American life about it years ago. So then I looked it up and then, you know, I just went totally down the rabbit hole on your website, like watched all the videos. And I was just like, wow, there's something really, really special, really interesting going on, on here with, with other side Academy. So, um, I, uh, I have some specific questions and I don't want to tread too much of the territory on your website. Like I'll let people go watch some of those videos because there's some really interesting stuff there, but I thought it'd be good to at least start with just, um, maybe you telling a little bit of your personal story and then just, just telling, kind of giving a basic overview about like what o- Oversight Academy is. Sure. Uh, so, you know, my, I'm Dave DeRocher. I'm the executive director at the Other Side Academy, but of course I haven't always been the executive director. I was a drug addict for well over 27 years. My addiction really started when I was about 12, stealing alcohol wow. from my dad's alcohol bottle and, you know, replacing it with water and hoping he wouldn't notice. And as you could imagine, he would come home from work one night and he had a drink and eventually he realized he wasn't getting the <laughs> desired effect. I was. <laughs> that that yeah. conversation didn't go well. <laughs> oh, geez. But yeah, but not long after that, I was doing cocaine. And then, you know, I did cocaine all the way through my high school years. I was the kind of kid that would sit in the back of the classroom with a vial of cocaine in my pocket. And when the teacher wasn't looking, I'd pour the coke between the pages of my math book or history book or English book, whatever class I was in. And uh, and when the teacher wasn't looking again, I'd pull the big pen apart, I'd lean over and I'd snort coke in class. That was back in the 80s. And could you imagine being a hmm. teenager completely addicted to <laughs> cocaine? It really made getting through school difficult, and uh, somehow I managed to graduate high school. But when I did, I graduated from cocaine to methamphetamine, mm. and that really Jeez. is where the wheels fell off. I uh, I never really set out to be a drug dealer, but as you know, as I was trying to s- support my habit, I buy a little, sell a little, buy a little, sell a little, and then pretty soon I was buying a little more. And I had no idea that I had an entrepreneurial gene in me because uh, I had mm. never uh, honed those skills because I was too busy getting high. And I started selling drugs and pretty soon I was buying more, selling more, buying and then, you know, buying pounds of meth a day and selling pounds of meth a day and making tens of thousands of dollars a month. So, you know, one thing led to another. And as you can imagine, that lifestyle doesn't last long. And really the lifestyle mm. itself became the intoxicant more than the drugs. It was the women, the power, the guns, the money, all of it. Kind of like what you see on TV. That's kind of it, that that part's real. That 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 lifestyle huh. became the true intoxicant. And then I started getting arrested, as you could imagine, and went to prison for my first, uh, my first term was two years. I went to prison, got out, stayed out 59 days, got busted again, went to prison for five years, uh, got out for 60 days. So at least I'm staying out longer, right? My first time I was out for 59, the second time I was out for 60. So I'm doing better, you know, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> uh, went, went back to prison and then got out uh, for four months. Went to prison for six years, got out for four months, went to prison for 10 years. So it was a two-year term, a five-year term, a six-year term, and a 10-year term with very little time out in between my terms. This is not an exaggeration, Brandon, when I say this. Uh, The minute I got out, I was on my way back every single term. The day out, out, you know, out of the gate by eight and back in the spoon by noon is how I kind of uh, uh, describe it. So, And and how how many total years was that? Well, you know, I was sentenced to a total of 22 years and did nearly 15. Wow. And each time that I was in prison, I never got out on my date. You know, in, in Utah, they have indeterminate sentences. You get a one to five, a zero to 15. You go to board, you get out at some point. In California, 
uh, where I did all of my time, you get a determinate sentence. So if I got a five-year term and I was doing half time, three or four months into my sentence, I would know what my parole date was. But I never paroled on my date because I always got in trouble. Uh, fights, Jeez. riots, you name it. And I was losing time. So I ended up doing a considerable amount of time on all of those terms. But then after my 10-year term, uh, I was out for about four months. And I had told myself in no uncertain terms that if I ever got arrested again, or if I ever got red lighted again or pulled over again, I'm not going to stop. I'm in Huntington Beach, California. I'm at a house in Huntington Beach. I'm looking out the window. I'm literally at a friend's house weighing up dope, uh, bagging it up, making phone calls. You can imagine how that goes. Or maybe not. And uh, I was I was looking out the I, and I'm looking out the window in my office right now, kind of pointing to the sky. And usually, police helicopters are just like floating around the city, patrolling the city, keeping an eye on things. There was a helicopter high, high in the sky, and it was just sitting there. And when I say high in the sky, I mean way up there. The fact that I saw it, it was just kind of crazy. And a couple hours later, when I was getting ready to leave. Brandon, it was still there. And I thought, I wonder, nah, uh -oh. couldn't be for me, right? No way. And, uh, and I leave that house and I get in my car and I take off. And when I left, the cops were literally everywhere. So they couldn't go in the house to get me because whoever told on me, which was the girl that lived there, she probably said, please don't come in the house. Wait till he leaves. And that's yeah. what they did. Yeah. And, uh, and I took him on a high speed chase. And uh, I had total wanton disregard for public safety. I was going through red lights. I was displacing the vehicles in my way. I wanted to get to a bridge in Huntington Beach on Atlantic and throw everything out the window into the water uh, on de below the bridge. And then if they found it, you know, they have to prove that that was mine. That was my train of thought. That's how uh, sick sure. I had become. And I never made it to that bridge. When I got to a roadblock on it, uh, Magnolia and Atlantic in Huntington Beach, I had a decision to make to go through that roadblock and risk uh, suicide by cop or stop and allow them to arrest me. And I had said before, I'm never going to stop again because I know when I get arrested, I'm going back to prison for the rest of my life. So I uh, hunkered down in my vehicle and I kind of went through that roadblock and I pushed the cars out of the way. And when I made the left-hand turn, the cop closest to me did the pit maneuver which is the pursuit intervention technique. And he spun me out of control, shoved me up on an embankment. And then the cops, of course, rushed the vehicle and pulled me out at gunpoint and commenced to give me one of the worst beatings of my life. The last thing I remember hearing before I woke up in the cop car was, stop, stop, you're going to kill him. Because we were wow. uh, up on an embankment kind of uh, in a strip mall. So there were people there that were seeing it and basically they had me. But the truth be told, I had every bit of that coming because that's the monster I had become. And I won't make any excuses for the police, but I don't know that I would have done anything differently chasing a guy like me, too. All of my prison priors were sales, transportation, loaded firearms, sometimes multiple firearms with black talons or cop killers in it, which are the bullets with the tops chopped off. So I was prepared to die at any given time. So they knew that. So I can't blame them for treating me the way that they did. Um, and when I went to jail and went to court for the first time, my original deal was 29 years. So two, then five, then six, then 10. And now I'm looking at a 29 year prison sentence to say that was humbling would be an understatement, a grave understatement. And I fought my case for a long time in the county jail, trying to get it down to something manageable. And over the months, a couple of the ancillary charges that didn't carry much weight had fallen off. And my deal was 22. And the judge was firm. Mr. DeRocher, your deal is 22 years. That's it. That's what you're getting. I've got you and you're going to prison for the rest of your life. So I fought my case for a long time pre-sentence in the hopes to get it down to something manageable like 15, 2, 5, 6, mm -hmm. 10. It just made sense to me, right? And, uh, and had they offered me 15 years at any given time, I would have jumped at that offer and then I wouldn't be sitting here today. Thankfully, the judge was uh, stoic in his stance and what he uh, thought he was going to give me, the 22 years. And he, I fought it and fought it and fought it. And then finally, I wrote Delancey Street a letter from the county jail. And they came and they interviewed me and they accepted me. So Delancey Street wow. is designed for guys like me, just complete knuckleheads who have destroyed their lives, didn't know how to live right. They graduated about 25,000 people back into the community successfully over the 50 years that they've been around. So, uh, but when I took that letter to the judge and the DA, they said, hell no, you are not Delancey Street <laughs> material. I am not sending you yeah. to Delancey Street. You know, I, can I say that word, hell? I've said it twice now. Yeah, that's fine. Um, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. <laughs> You know, they, uh, they said no, and the judge was emphatic when he said it. So needless to say, I go back to my cell, and as you can imagine, I'm completely dejected. I'm demoralized. I'm like, God, this is real. I'm going to prison for the rest of my life. I've already lived there for a, a pretty good chunk of my adult life, and I'm going to go there and die. 
Uh, so what I did was one day I decided because I wasn't really busy in my cell in the evenings, I wrote the judge a letter. And uh, I never told him he was wrong in his assessment of me. And that letter was four pages long, front and back. And I said, Your Honor, what do you have to lose? If you send me to Delancey Street and I make it, the next time you see me, it's because I'm coming back to say thank you. Or I get kicked out or I split and you can lock me up for the rest of my life. About six weeks later, I went to to court and uh, sitting in that cage with ankle irons, waist irons, handcuffs, not knowing what to expect. And Judge Pacheco said, Mr. DeRocher, against my better judgment, I'm going to give you the opportunity of a lifetime. Wow. And he sent me to Delancey Street, which is a two-year program, instead of the 22-year prison sentence. That was nearly uh, 16 years ago. It was hands down. Can I ask Go real ahead. quickly about that too? Sure. Like uh, how much uh, how much was it necessary for you at that point to just be facing kind of just this really hopeless situation to to bring you – to the point of kind of being ready for something like Delancey Street. Like, did it really take to that moment till you were ready um, to, yeah, to can, do something like that? Can I share a story with you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, after my after my third prison term, two, five, six, in between my third term and my fourth term, which was 10 years, I wrote Delancey Street a letter and they came and they interviewed me and they didn't accept me. Now, I had no idea mm-hmm. why. I just got a letter of non-acceptance, no bed space, and I went and did my time. I didn't really mm-hmm. think much of it. And I didn't know why they didn't accept me other than they said no bed space. That was a a canned data uh, response, basically, which I found out later. Now, the second time, they did take me. I don't know why they didn't the first time, nor why they did the second time, until I got to Delancey Street, and I was there for about Hmm. two and a half years, and I became an interviewer myself. Then I knew why they didn't take my no good, uh, I'm going to leave those words out, at that time. (laughs) It dawned on me, Brandon, why they didn't. And in my first interview, all I talked about was the drugs, the guns, the mayhem, the chaos, Mm -hmm. the violence. All I tried to do is impart upon the interviewer who I was at that moment. I was nowhere near ready to change. That interviewer saw right through me, knew exactly who I was, and he left me there in jail, right where I belonged. And truth be told, him not accepting me and leaving me in jail was the best thing he could have done. He saved my life. I wasn't ready to change. Mm -hmm. Had they released me, I would have split. I wasn't ready. Now fast forward to my second interview. I remember answering the questions honestly, talking about all the things that were important, my family who I was losing now for the first time, my mom and dad were washing their hands, the kids I didn't raise. And at the end of the interview, I remember standing up and trying to reach for the glass with my hands cuffed to my waist and pounding on that glass, crying, begging the interviewer for a chance. And he took me. So that was the difference between the two interviews. So to answer your question, yes, it did take that to give me the incentive to actually go, okay, I'm done. I need to do something different. But for guys like me, the 30, 60, 90 day model, and we can get to that maybe a little bit later, wouldn't have worked for me. It's not long enough. So that was the incentive that I needed. And then when I got to Delancey Street, I'm so fortunate. They beat the bark off me in games, which are the therapy groups as they addressed all of my behaviors. But I didn't just stay in Delancey Street for two years, which was required to beat my 22-year prison sentence. I stayed in Delancey Street for eight and a half years, two to beat the 22-year prison sentence, six and a half more because I fell in love with the process and for the first time in my life with me. And the last five years that I was at the L.A. facility, I managed the L.A. facility, which was upwards of 200 to 250 residents at any given time and 15 vocational training schools that generated all the revenue. So here's a guy that went from 27 years of drug addiction, many years in prison to running a multi-million dollar organization, helping other people get from where I was to where I had gotten. Talk about transformation. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's such an inspiring story. I just get so excited even even just hearing about it and just the idea that you would you do something like that and and choose to stay another six six something years, um, six and a half years or what I can't remember exactly what you said, but yeah. um, yep. I, I'm I'm interested in. It seems like there is something. There's clearly something that's that's missing in in people's lives that that leads them to to make whatever these choices are, whether it's drugs or, or crime. Um, so what is it exactly you see that, that something like Delancey street or other side Academy, what, what is it that it gives them that they are trying to find in, in those other things? Well, here, I, I want to, if you give me a few minutes, I can really put this, uh, in layman's terms for people to understand. Okay. So I was a drug addict for 27 years in Delancey street. If you talked about drugs, it's an actionable offense. You are in trouble. 
at the other side academy if you talk about drugs. It's an actionable offense. You are in trouble. My problem even just in nothing- passing, even just yeah, mentioning I- it. Well, no, no. I mean, not just mentioning, but if you talk about your past as it relates to drugs and drugs okay, as the gotcha. problem, gotcha. yeah, it's it's an actionable offense because drugs are not our problem. Take a guy like me who was a drug addict mm-hmm. for 27 years and spent his adult life in prison. Could you imagine sending me to a 30-day model? Let me describe to you what that would look like. Dave DeRocher yeah. walks in, sits down with the counselor. A counselor goes, so, you a drug addict? Yes, I am. How much money do you have? The first question they're going to ask me is, how much money do you have? Well, I don't have any. He's going to go, well, sorry, go die. He won't say those words. He'll show me where the door is at and say, we can't help you <laughs> because they can't help you if you don't have any money. What a broken system. Mm. Now, yeah. let's just say I've got mom and dad with me on each side of me. And I look at my mom and dad and they look at me and they go, Dave, we've already mortgaged our home twice for the other six programs you failed. And dad pulls out, uh, out of his pocket $2,600. That's all he has left to his name. And he hands it to the counselor. The counselor is going to go, well, 2600 bucks as he's counting it. Uh, here's six penicillin. Hope that works. Brandon, the amount of help you get is determined by how much money you have. This is what mm. we've been doing in this, in, this, in, in this country for decades. We are killing more people than we're helping. The recovery mm. models, 30, 60, 90 day models have a three to 5% success rate. They don't work very well, but at least they're expensive. And then, <laughs> right. And, and, and then yeah. on day 29, they're going to come and tell me, Mr. DeRocher, pack your bags. It's time to leave. But counselor, I'm not ready. DeRocher, pack your bags. It's time to leave. Counselor, yeah. I'm not ready. I'm going to reoffend. I'm going to use again. We're not telling you again, pack your bags. You have to leave tomorrow. And Brandon, why do we do that? The funding's run out. Yeah. Could you yeah. think about the system? We're going to help you as long as you've got money. If you don't, you can't be here or you have to leave. But I'm going to go out and use again. I'm going to reoffend. Oh, well, you don't have any money left. Go do that. That's basically how it works. It's a completely yeah. broken system built around a funding model rather than a helping model. Now let's mm-hmm. come to Delancey Street or TOSA, the Other Side Academy. At the Other Side Academy, we're two and a half years long, residential. We are free. Two and a, when was the last time you heard of something longer than 90 days? We're two and a half years long, residential and free, and we take free. no money from the government. Nothing from the city, the county, the state, the federal government, nothing from rich mommy and daddy, no Medicaid money, nothing. We generate all of our own revenue through our social enterprises that the students own and operate, which means the day they get here, they're part of the solution, not the problem. And our minimum commitment's two and a half years But you can stay longer like I did in Delancey Street because there isn't a drug addict or any group of drug addicts on the face of the planet that are the same. It is different for every one of us. Nobody's ready on day 30, day 60, or Mm. day 90. Nobody is. They leave because they have to or because they can. At TOSA, you can stay until you're ready to reintegrate back into the community and become a productive member. You don't have to leave on a particular day. So those are the two things that are really important. Yeah. And that's, uh, and that's, that's as, as long as you want, as long as you want to stay and, and contribute at, at TOSA, it's like you, you exactly. are, are free to be there. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and here's, the, here's the other thing that's important. I want to get back to your question because I went on a tangent a little bit about the two, the differences between a therapeutic model that's long-term like ours and a recovery model that's 30, 60 or 90 days. But here's the other thing that's important. Have you, do do have you ever known a drug addict? Uh, I think, I think I have, I have to, I'd have to think about it a second, but I'm pretty, okay. pretty sure definitely with, definitely with alcohol. I've known, right. I've known some people that are well, alcoholic. Okay. Here's, here's the thing. Drug addicts have a lot in common. You will never meet a drug addict who isn't a liar, a cheater, mm. a thief, or yeah. a manipulator. Those you're not born with those, uh, uh, character flaws. You acquire them through years of use. So the drug addict has to lie and cheat and steal and manipulate people. Every drug addict's like that. So if you send us to a 30, 60, 90 day model and we white knuckle it, we're clean and sober for 30 days, who cares? That's not the answer. Getting people clean and sober, and that's the term we use in this community so much, clean and sober, clean and sober, clean and sober. Who cares if you are still a liar and a cheater and a thief and a manipulator and a self-centered, self-seeking human being that doesn't care about others, you're going to use again. Welcome to those Mm -hmm. models. At the Other Side Academy, yeah. we don't even talk about drugs. We are going to talk about honesty, accountability, and integrity. 
and we are going to pound it down your throat until it becomes who you are, not just what you do. If you give this population a long time and a healthy community until they learn to live in a healthy community, you solve the drug problems without ever even addressing them because drugs aren't the problem. They're yeah. just not. Yeah, that's and it's something that I think I've you've been hearing more and more lately. Yeah, they talk about these studies where they take they take mice and the, the you know mice mm-hmm. when they're by themselves mm-hmm. and they're given the choice of heroin. I'm sure you've heard this before. Of you know, course, by themselves they'll they'll do heroin, but you put them put them in a community, you know, and suddenly um, suddenly they don't want to do do heroin or whatever it is anymore. Right. Um, and I think I think this is like a lesson that's that's more applicable more broadly than just to, to people involved with drugs or or, or crime, but there's, mm-hmm. there's kind of a sickness in general that a lot of people are missing, missing community and are, are unhealthy, maybe not in such obvious ways as someone that's going to jail, but a lot of people are unhealthy because they're missing this thing. And it's it, like, I look at other side Coma- Academy and I'm like, I, there's part of me that I want, I want my kids to go there <laughs> rather than going yeah. to college. You know, if that right, makes any right. sense. <laughs> you nailed it. I want it, them to really. learn how to be good people. Yes. You know? Yes. You nailed it. The, the community yeah. at large needs to come spend a couple years here. This is not an exaggeration. Yeah. I spend half of my day, and so does my leadership team, working with the, the community at large. Heck, I'm working with the Salt Lake City Police Department right now and even the mayor because what we're trying to do mm-hmm. is help them train their officers. Because what happens is if you take the Derek Chauvin incident with George Floyd mm-hmm. when he had yeah. his ne- uh, knee on his neck, that wasn't the issue. It was an unfortunate circumstance uh, byproduct of the issue. The fact is the other officers were watching it and they didn't say anything, probably because yeah. they're contracted up, which means they're already holding, already holding each other's secrets. Otherwise, one of them would have said, hey, Chauvin, get off his neck. He's already handcuffed. Stand him up because that would have been the right thing to do. But if they don't say mm-hmm. anything, it's usually because they've got other secrets they're holding. And that happens all the time because the question is, in most organizations in corporate America and law enforcement and the medical field, what are people beholden to? Power? or truth. Almost always it's power. And if you're beholden to power, you're going to put blinders on and you're not going to say anything. That's what we teach Mm. here. You see something, you say something, pass the information, make sure the person who's doing whatever they're doing gets the help that they need. And we can address those issues so they can make the necessary changes. You know, what would have happened if somebody would have said something to Tom Brady before he asked the equipment manager to deflate the ball a couple years ago? Sure. Yeah. You know, would the Super Bowl have changed? What would have happened if, uh, if uh, uh, what's the gentleman's name who was marching all the children up to his room? Uh, uh, what's his I don't name? Know if I know this one. Yeah, he's a, it's a big name. He's the the. Uh, was he the doctor, the like gymnast doctor? But... No, he. Uh, okay. Uh, anyway, he was the guy that was you know marching all those young kids up to his room and doing what he was doing with them, and he you know a couple of years ago got busted. Could you imagine if somebody would have said something at the beginning, Harvey Weinstein? Oh yeah, that's right. Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah. right. But nobody says anything because they're beholden to power rather than truth. Mm. So here we make yeah. sure people if they see something, they say something. Mm. So yeah, that's. I think that's a good point to to really. I I think the part I'm most interested in with this model is just that. I mean, you can think of it as like a therapeutic model. It's it's a type of therapy where you're helping people to be better people. Mm-hmm. But it's it's interesting that it is it doesn't involve like credential clinical therapists that you guys hire. You know, right. you right. have this process that's kind of uh, emerged naturally. That it's it's the people that are actually dealing with the problems that are the ones that have have solved the problem. You know, mm-hmm. not mm-hmm. some people distant in some other some other city or town that's that's trying to solve the pro- someone else's problem. Um, so I'm, I'm interested in some of the details of of how this works, how it makes people's lives better, how it how it helps them to make the the positive changes. Um, and I, I mean, know there's a lot of parts of it, but I'm kind of interested in um, you call them the games, yep. like the kind of therapeutic. Is this yep. is this like a daily thing that you, that that they do at Other Side Academy, or um, is it like me, weekly? Yeah, let me share that. I'm with interested you. in how that works. Yeah, yeah. Okay. You just touched on a really, really good point. There are no doctors, no counselors, and no therapists here. So some people go, well, then how do they get better? Oh, please stop. I can tell you multiple (laughs) times when I was younger and I was going to doctors, counselors, and therapists. Now, although most of them are well-intentioned, here's a guy with a 27-year drug history who spent his life on the streets, in jails, and in prisons. If I just go to a doctor who's never done any of that, what do they truly know about what I'm going through? 
What do they truly yeah, know nothing. other than what they read in the book when they were going to school? And I could remember times when I'm opining to my counselor or my doctor about my problems. And I could see them looking at me with that blank stare like, oh, God, Dave said this on page 73 of the manual. I'm supposed to respond with, oh, here it is. That's how it feels. Yeah. Because they don't have any experiential overlap. There's there's no perceived similarity. I've got a doctor trying to fix the broken person. Now come to Tosa. Mm. Everybody here is just like you, only farther removed. There is nobody here with a PhD, but most of us have a PhD. You are not going to tell us anything we haven't already been through ourselves. All of my staff have been through the Delancey Street model or through this model and are many, many, many years removed from the lifestyle. But we can draw from those experiences and connect with these students in a way that nobody else can. You know, the best way I could equate it is giving birth to a child. And I'm, I'm using my arms to, to show you this. Now I take delivery of the baby. I cut the umbilical mm -hmm. cord. I give the baby its first breath. So I have the baby on my shoulder. And Brandon, I can do that a thousand times. I can still never tell the mom what it's like to give birth. I don't care how yeah. many times I can do it. I only know what I think I know. Now, when you get in an organization like this where everybody here is just like you, same experiences, in many cases worse and for much longer, you can't come to us and go, well, you don't understand. The hell we don't. Sit down. Let me explain something to you. And we can connect. And when the students see that all of my staff at my facility, all of my staff, Brandon, we live on property. We don't punch in at 8 o'clock in the morning and we don't punch out at 5 o'clock in the evening. We live here with them every step of the way. So they see that and they're instantly bought in because they know how committed we are. Show me another organization yeah. that does that. Now, the yeah. feedback mechanisms are going are gonna to really astound you. So games. Games is the opportunity for students to be in a room of their peers and call each other on their behavior. So Tuesday mm -hmm. nights and Friday nights, 7.30 to 10, every Tuesday and Friday yeah. night. 20 people in this room, 20 in the other room, 20 in the other room, 20 That's until everybody's group. in there. Yeah, you've got about 20 people and we address each other's mm -hmm. behavior. So let's say, for example, uh, there's been a there's a woman that's been here for a year and a half. I just came here from jail. I'm attracted to her. I wrote her a letter. I'm not allowed to talk to her for the first year because you know how drug addicts are, right? Mm -hmm. They're the neediest creatures on the face of the planet. If they see a cute person, they're going to go after them, right? Because we're predators that way. Mm -hmm. Um so I get here and I immediately write her a note. I pass it to my homeboy. He gives it to her. She reads it. She's like, oh, God, Dave likes me. She writes me back. Now we're contracted up. She should have told on me, right? But she didn't. Yeah. And my homeboy that I've known for a long time and I gave it to him, he passed it to her. So now we're busted. Now we're sitting in games. Boy, is it going to be ugly. So Dave, who in the hell do you think you are? You've been here for 10 days. You're already writing Susie a letter. She's got a 10-year prison sentence suspended over her head. And right here in the letter, it says you really care about her. You selfish SOB, if you cared about her, you'd leave her alone. Because if you guys get dirty together and she leaves, she's going back to prison. And then you pulled Bobby into it. You, you told Bobby to give the letter to her. And he did. He had to sneak it to her. Then she sold out and wrote you back. So you can imagine what games looks like. They're going to play the game with mm. me over my behavior, but it has nothing to do with the letter. I was sneaky when I wrote the letter. Then I gave it to my buddy because I've known him for a long time in the program, you know, from before the program. And I, and I pulled him into my stuff. He gave it to her. So all of us are going to get completely blistered in the game. Now that's kind of a mm. big deal when those things happen, but let's, let's, let's back it up some. Let's say that uh, we all go down from five, from four to five to shower before dinner. And I jump in the shower first every day and I take 40 minutes and there's four more guys that need to shower. How selfish am I? Then when I run to the dining room, I jump in the line at salad bar and I cut into the line. So now I'm selfish in my room. I'm selfish at the salad line. So they're going to play the game with me about what a selfish SOB I am. I don't care about anybody else in the room. I don't care about anybody in the dining room, but welcome to the drug addict. That's who we are. And there's a million other things that happen. Maybe I stole a pair of socks down in laundry after I've been here for a year because they're nicer than the ones I've got. Maybe uh, in the dining room, I take the food and I hide it behind the toaster so I can get back to it later. You name it, we play the game with each other over it. You, do you understand mm -hmm. what I'm saying? And that way you're hearing, yeah, yeah. You're I'm, hearing it from your peers. I'm, so I'm, I'm kind of interested that it seems like it's, it's all very behavior focused. It's it all saying- behavior. Yeah. Here's how you're supposed to be acting, and this is how you are not conforming to how you're supposed to be acting. That's exactly it, Brandon. And, and here's an easier way to put it. Let's say drug. you have the drug addict and you have the criminal. If you get the criminal uh, with the criminal thinking, 
clean and sober for 30 days, who cares? If he didn't change the way he thinks and change the paradigm and view the world differently, if he's not honest, not accountable, and doesn't have integrity, who cares if he was clean for 30 days? Again, who cares? If he hasn't changed those behaviors, he's going to go back to that same lifestyle. So we focus on behaviors. We take the most broken people. Our average student has been arrested over 25 times. And get this, if your 30, 60, 90 day models can boast a three to 5% success rate, we boast 85%. People who stay with us for two and a half years and graduate have an 85% success rate, DCE, drug-free, crime-free, and employed. People who stay four years or longer, 100% of them are drug-free, crime-free, and employed. (laughs) Because the farther you get away from the lifestyle and the new habits that you learn keep you from going back to the old ones. People often ask, and I say, well, you know, if you got away from that lifestyle for one day, could you change? No. Two days? Mm -hmm. No. Well, how long does it take? It takes as long as it takes. So you stay in a community of healthy living until you learn to live in a community of healthy living. And really, all TOSA is is a micro community, and I'm cupping my hands, small, micro community, Mm. getting you ready for the macro community, and I'm pointing out my window. That's all we are. Learn to live Mm. in a community of healthy living. Be good to your neighbors, tell the truth, be honest, be accountable, and if you don't do those things while you're here, there are consequences you're going to pay, not just the games. Mm. So, um, yeah, I want... I want to talk a little bit about some more of the therapeutic outsets outside, but I'm still kind of interested in in the games. Um, Mm -hmm. I mean, is what are what are the rules then, or what, what what things can you not do within the games? What are off limits within the games? So that's you ask good questions, Brandon. Uh, no, <laughs> you can't you can't uh, talk or play the game with people about something they can't change. So I'm bald. They can't talk to me about being bald. I can't talk to anybody yeah. about their sexuality or race, color, creed. Uh, no calling somebody a rat or a snitch. No getting out of your seat and no violence. And we never have, we've Mm. been here for five years, never had an act of violence because we asked them not to. It's that simple. And nobody really wants to do that. If they did, they wouldn't be here. So those are really the the hard stops. Those are the rules. Otherwise, everything's fair game. Sometimes, Brandon, in a game, it would be like this. Brandon, you were late to work the other day. It's the second time you've been late this year. And you might go, well, you're right, I was. We'll go, how can you be late to work when you live where you work? It's not like you're stuck in traffic. Right. You might get a game just like that where we're just bringing something to your attention or when they were talking to me about the letter and I'm pushing back and I'm fighting, then the game could get escalated and the voices could get very loud, very colorful and vernacular until they pounded into me that what I did is true. What they're telling me is true. It's all about truth. And oftentimes the only way we hear it is loud and colorful and vernacular and really just, you know, point blank without sugarcoating anything. So, so no limits on language, you know, past saying, you know, offensive no stuff about, yeah, no yeah. limits. Okay. Is that yeah. just within the, within the bounds of games? That's like, uh-huh. okay, this, this type of language is okay in games outside of games, you know, yeah. talk like you would your grandma. Yeah. We want you to act respectful on the floor, but you got to remember games serves yeah. a, a, mul- a multitude of purposes. So let's say you have a group of people here that are very angry at themselves over the lifestyles they've been living. So they can't use drugs anymore. They can't use their fists anymore. They can't hurt people anymore. They can't have sex anymore. They've got, they don't have those outlets anymore. So sometimes games Mm. is a wonderful place to vent. That is the place that's a controlled environment where you can go in there and just bleh. And I'm, I'm, I'm pushing my head right now and I'm letting the vent off to, to let off some steam. Games are great for that too. So you can address each other's behaviors. You can hear feedback about your own. And to some degree, you can vent and let some of that steam off. It's an amazing, Mm -hmm. amazing process for this population. Yeah, I think it's so fascinating. This this seems like one of those things as I'm kind of poking around at looking at looking at Other Side Academy. There's a lot of things about it where you have uh, one thing you do that serves like five different functions. Absolutely. It's like you Mm -hmm. you tell me about games and games does this and this and this. You look at like the, the, the work that people do, it obviously it funds other side Academy, but it also has yep. this communal purpose and this therapeutic purpose. And, yep. um, I think that's, that's, that's very interesting. What, one more question about game. I mean, I could, I could talk the whole time about games cause I'm just, I'm super, sure. I'm super fascinated by this idea that you have this effective mode of therapy that does not fit any other model that is not run by a therapist. I mean, it's not, yeah. it's, it's totally different than something like group therapy. Group therapy is people that don't know each other. They have the same, this is actual people that live with each other, work with each other each day. Yep. Are there any limits on 
on just like being an, an asshole within games where you're just like, you're just being too mean, you know, is there any kind of like, whoa, pull it back a little bit or oh, of course, it's just like, every, yeah, okay. every, every game has two strengths in there, older students to moderate okay. the game. And it, it gotcha. doesn't happen often, but what ends up happening is if someone is playing a really mean game, then they're, as soon as yeah. they're done with that game, the whole room's going to put the game on them. So the game serves a purpose there too, because what the game often does is it shows your ass to who you are. So let's say you go to a game yeah. and you get the gameplay to Dave. I got the gameplay with me over that letter I wrote, right? And one of the guys who played yeah. the game with me, he was spot on, but I don't like him. So when the game's off me, okay, Brandon, but let me talk to you. Now, what am I? Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? Now I'm just being vindictive. So I'm going to get the vindictive mm -hmm. game. So it, it, mm -hmm. it allows you to really to really uh, uh, act out who you really are and for your peers to point it out and trust and believe. And some people may argue with me on this. There is no doctor, counselor, or therapist on the face of the planet that's going to identify our problems any better than we can in a room like that while we're addressing each other's behavior. You couldn't mm -hmm. identify it like we can because everybody in that room is us. You know what I mean? If you spot yeah, it, you've got yeah. it. You can't get anything yeah. past this population. So what, what does it look like? Does, do the games ever take like a positive turn? Like, what does that oh, look like yeah, when yeah. Are people ever just like, Hey, you're doing awesome. You're killing it. You're making a great change. Like, uh -huh. is that part of it too? Yeah. So, you know, games is, is designed specifically to address each other's behaviors and to give feedback. What we don't do a lot of here is, Oh, Brandon, you're just doing so great and pat you on the back. Cause what ends up happening is when people go into the game and they do that, let's say you and me are in the same game and I'm going, and I'm just on your leg, right? Oh, Brandon, you're doing yeah. so good. Brandon, I love you, man. You've changed so much. Odds are you and me are dirty. Odds are you gotcha. and me are yeah, contacted yeah. up. But what you will see, <laughs> what, right? It means you and I are holding each other's secrets. And I'm just letting you know, I got your brother. Yeah. You got me, right? And we don't play the game with each other because all we're doing is riding each other's legs because we know that we're, you know, we're holding each other's secrets. But what you will yeah. see is, let's say a year later, I've made some significant changes. I don't, I don't act like that anymore. I'm not looking at the women. I'm not passing notes. I'm really putting my head down. I'm doing what's asked of me. You might play the game with me and go, you know what, Dave? Man. A year ago, this is who you were. Six months ago, you were better. Today, I see you helping the younger students. I see you working hard at work. I see your attitudes changed. Heck, you haven't got any community service, which is one of the consequences in almost a year. You've made some really positive changes. That's not what the game is designed for. But every once in a while, there's the player of the year. And, and, and you will hear some stuff like that. But here's the mm -hmm. other thing. People don't realize this because we make excuses for drug addicts today. We do it all the time. Oh, the poor drug addict. Mm. They have a disease. Now you just gave us an excuse to use. And whether it, you know the addiction is a disease or not is above all of our pay grades because it's not the kind of thing that anyone can prove. Because let me ask you a question, Brandon. Um, are you yeah. a good person? Are you a good person? Yeah, basically. Yeah. Do you, <laughs> has, have, have bad things ever happened to you? Absolutely. Yeah. Do you do, you do heroin when it happens? No, I've so, had my, I've had my other addictions, but yeah, not <laughs> yeah. But, but here's the thing. Well, now we make excuses for drug addicts. We say when something bad happens, we call it a trigger or you drive by Jennifer's house, which is your ex. And you see the truck in the driveway and you know, it's Bobby's. And then after two years of sobriety, you start using and someone says, well, why did you do it? Well, I got triggered. We keep making excuses for drug addicts and giving them excuses to use. They're going to, we're killing them again. So in the games, we hold you accountable for all of your behaviors. It's so important to do that, to hold everybody accountable for their behaviors. That's where games really, yeah. uh, it, it, it gets its power from, is making sure that every little thing is addressed because we don't make excuses because drugs aren't the problem. Behaviors are. And then there aren't, there aren't the things simmer, simmering underneath the rest of the time, right? Like yep. resentments and, and this and that and... Yeah, that's really interesting to me. I see like a lot of wisdom in 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 how that um, progresses. Here's another important thing. You know, we've been open in Salt Lake City now for just over five years. Right now, I've got 94 former drug addicts and former criminals living here on this property. You want to know how many, and all of them are on AP and P, which is adult parole and probation. Brandon, you want to okay. know how many dirty tests we've given to adult parole and probation in five years? Um, zero. 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 <laughs> We've never yeah. given dirty drug tests to adult parole and probation because there's no drugs in the facility. It's because mm. the culture is so tight because in those games, that's where everything comes out. It's amazing. You'll go into a game 
right? You'll be addressing one of your mm-hmm. peers or one of your peers will be addressing you. And then somebody else will say something and you catch the fact that they're lying. It's amazing. It's, it's a room of truth. You cannot get away mm-hmm. with anything in that room. And that keeps all the big yeah. things from happening is how you manage the house. Wow. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting because my experience with therapy and it's, it's been like, a, I've had a very positive experience with, with therapy, but it's all been like very emotion focused. So it's about learning to kind of get past my anger or whatever my issues are and mm-hmm. being able to figure out like, Oh, I actually have this like sadness or like this, this, whatever, um, disappointment underneath that and being able to own up to that, you know? Sure. Um, and it's interesting that you guys are, it's, it's more just about behavior. It doesn't sound like there's a lot of, maybe there is of sitting there saying I I'm hurt. I'm sad. I mean, is there some of that too, of just like oh, yeah. talking open about what's going on yeah. Under, underneath? Yeah. So what okay. happens is we have, I've got 10, 11 staff members here now, and we're mm. constantly uh, engaging in conversations with the students one-on-one about those very things. Mm. We tell them okay. that, uh, talk about it. If you don't talk it out, you're going to act it out. So people will come yeah. in my office or I'll catch them on the floor all the time. They're like, Dave, this is what I'm going through. I'm thinking this, I'm thinking that. We're constantly the coach, the mentor, the therapist, and the doctor. But again, mm. who better to do this than people who have been, felt exactly the way they did back when they were in the same place they were. I'm 15, mm-hmm. almost 16 years removed from the lifestyle, but I've got 40 years of experience on both sides of the fence the bad side and the good side. So when you come in and go, man, I'm missing my kids. I think I need to leave because they need me. Did you say that again out loud? You haven't had custody of your kids in 10 years. They're fostered out. Grandma and grandpa have the other one. You haven't been there. You've been in jail. What do you mean you miss them? What are you talking about? But that's the excuse you'll use to leave because you're going to, but you'll never even go see your kids like you never have. So everything that they're going through, they come and talk to staff about it. We talk them off the ledge. We talk them off the ledge. We get them through those things. It's it's Mm. fascinating. So games is to address behaviors and one-on-one conversations is to to address the emotional problems that they may be going through. Gotcha. Gotcha. Where they maybe feel a little bit, I don't know if the right word is they may may feel a little bit safer to kind of be vulnerable and, um, you know, how much of this is about that, about people learning to be like, Hey, I don't need to like cover stuff up so much. I don't have to be a tough guy. I can be just a good person. That's open about what I'm going through. Yeah. That's really, really important. That's why we live on property so that they see Mm. that we're as bought in as they are. And we're open and Mm. and honest with them too. And and here's the other thing. So if I just backtrack a little to games, Joseph Grenny is our Mm -hmm. founder. Tim is our CEO. I'm the executive director. Brandon, if we do something wrong, the students can drop a slip on us and take us to a game. They can call me on the carpet. When was the last time you could take your boss into a room and go, listen, you SOB, I saw what you did the other day and call them on the carpet and have a job Monday. Mm -hmm. So they know we are as bought in as they are and we are as open and honest and vulnerable as we ask them to be. So when they see us in games and they see us going to all the, you know, and we're helping them, it's super easy for them to be open, honest, and vulnerable because they're talking to them in the future. Yeah. Talking yeah. to themselves. So we're uh, just farther along. Yeah. Maybe if I could I, jump topic here a little bit. Um, I, I, I wanted to get to asking about more what it's like for people when they kind of finish at Other Side Academy. What mm-hmm. What's life like afterwards? And you talked a little bit about like recidivism rate. Um, I'm kind of interested in uh, how much of that community uh, like carries on afterwards. Is there kind of like a, an alumni community afterwards? Um, what does that look like, if anything? That's a that's a really good question. So Delancey Street, where I was from, and a number of my staff members, the last 90 days of your stay, whether you're there for two years, five years, or eight years, the last 90 days of your stay, you actually go out in the community and you get a job. You turn your mm-hmm. money into finance so they can hold it for you during the time that you're out so you're not running around with all that money in your pocket. At the end of the 90 days in Delancey Street, you get half of it. They keep the other half. Hmm. Now go to LA or San Francisco. You know what the job market's like, right? Uh, sure. Yeah. Let's say let's say it takes you a month because you have a history like mine just to find a job, and the job I found pays fifteen dollars an hour. So I've only been working for two months. I've made thirty five hundred dollars, and Delancey Street keeps half. How the hell am I going to get my life started with seventeen hundred and fifty bucks or whatever that number is, right? Mm-hmm. Um, here at the Other Side Academy, the last ninety days of your stay, you go out in the community, you get a job. Your money gets turned into finance. We hold it for you. And at the end of 90 days, you get all of it. So if you're out and this is, Brandon, this is important. 
every single graduate at TOSA here in, in Salt Lake City, every single graduate, we have a job for them on day one of their workout phase. Hmm. Everybody. We've spent the last five years building uh, relationships and networking with organizations all over the valley. I have so many companies knocking on my door on a regular basis so in, saying, do you have any more graduates? I need some more graduates. <laughs> uh, that's all we're hiring now are TOSA graduates because we have a monster work ethic and we're on time. We dress right. We speak right. We sit. If we see something, we say something. So all the graduates start a job right away. We give them all their yeah. money and then they go across the street and they live in graduate housing and they can stay in graduate housing for up to a year. And in some cases, mm -hmm. if they ask for an extension, they can stay longer for $100 uh, 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 a week. All they're doing is mm -hmm. paying $400 a month for the room. And in some cases, less. If they're sharing an apartment with other people, then we reduce their rent. So they may be over there with four people for $200 a month for a year. Every single graduate buys their car, gets their insurance, has money in the bank before they move out and reintegrate back into the community uh, at large. So it's a slow trend. It's a slow uh, uh, process. We call it graduated mastery. Instead of kicking them out at the end of the 90 days saying, good luck, we let you stay in graduate housing. Then we also have the alumni group. If you're an alumni and you're in good standing, you can come back to the Other Side Academy anytime you want, 24-7. You can come to breakfast. You can come to lunch. The graduates who oh, live across awesome. the street, they come here and eat. Uh, they're required to come to games once a week if you live in graduate housing to keep you connected. So it's a slow, slow uh, disconnect between the Other Side Academy and the real world. And then even once you do move out, we, uh, we, we want you to stay connected. So we have some, some things in place for that as well. Wow. That's cool. So like anytime, uh, any alumni in, in good standing, they can, I mean, maybe give you a call or something, or they can just show up and be like, Hey, I'm just going to come. Of course. You know, yep. This is their meet home forever. Or, can they? Awesome. That's very cool. Yeah. Um, and I think that's, that's probably a very important part of, part of, uh, the equation is like, uh, yeah, I, I a lot of times the way I, I kind of, I kind of think about it is, uh, a community like this, uh, it ends up kind of being a, a seed for, for, for what, what the culture is going to be outside of that community. So it's mm -hmm. like, you have other side Academy, but then those, those values, they spread outwards, right? Yeah. Like you, they've, they're started there and, and it becomes the, the seed of something that, that can grow. Yep. Um, yeah. Do you, do you ever have people kind of compare? I, I look at other side Academy sometimes and I'm like, it seems to me like a, a like a modern monastery. Like you guys have this, it's like secular. It isn't religious. And now we can talk about religion too you're kind of doing something very similar people live this very austere lifestyle and you know, they become better people. Of course they don't have to stay for their whole lives, you know, if, if they don't want to, but I, I think it's really important to, to note that usually if you go to a 30, 60, 90 day model, somebody else is paying for your recovery, rich mommy and daddy mm. Medicaid, which is the taxpayer city, county, state, uh, whatever funding you get, which is the taxpayer. Wow. And then your, mm -hmm. then your recovery is being paid by people uh, outside of your circle, right? Uh, the community is paying for it, mom and dad or the taxpayer. When you come here, you're doing it yourself. The minute you get here, you're part of the solution rather than part of the problem. We don't take any outside funding. We generate it all ourselves. That's when the magic happens because our social enterprises generate all the revenue. And the moving company here in Salt Lake City, if you look up the other side movers, is the number one rated moving company in the entire state of Utah. Do you remember mm -hmm. what the average arrest was for my students? Oh, some uh, tw uh, 20 something? Sorry, 25, remember. 25 times. Okay. Think, think about that. <laughs> my average student, you're good. My average student's been arrested 25 times. <laughs> think about that for a second. It's the long-term drug addict coupled with the criminal component. We have the number one rated moving company in the entire state. This is the same population that at some point in time, they were carrying your merchandise out your window. Now they wrap it up, take it through the front door and <laughs> deliver it to the other side, right? Yeah, I say yeah. that somewhat tongue in cheek, but it's true. Our moving companies, number one, our thrift boutiques, we've got two of them now, are the number one rated thrift boutiques in Salt Lake City. Brandon, we won the Ernst and Young Entrepreneurs of the Year in 2017. Here we are at the Grand yeah. America, the nicest hotel in Utah, and the Grand Ballroom, and they announced Tosa as the Entrepreneurs of the Year. We're ran by former criminals and former drug addicts winning an award yeah. that most of society could only dream to win. Think about what's happening here. Work is the Petri dish. When you go to other models, you're sitting around with your hat on crooked, your pants sagging, 
You're on your cell phone talking to your toxic girlfriend who's with another guy, but she's not telling you that while, you know, while she's getting high and we, and those other programs allow you to talk to her here. You're getting up every day. You're going to work. You're generating revenue. You're paying it forward. You're not on your phone with toxic relationships on the street. You're doing exactly what you need to do until you learn to do exactly what you need to do. And those social enterprises are generating all the revenue so we can continue to help people without charging them. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, a couple of things that really strike me about that are like, A, first of all, it's like it's it's a, it's a system built in such a way that, that there is a cost to be a part of the system, but the only one that can pay that price is the person who's like in the system, right? Absolutely. You can't be, can't be mom or dad. Can't You have to pay that cost, which I think makes yep. a big difference in how invested you are in it. Yep. The other yep. thing that kind of occurs to me is like this, this entrepreneurial award, like we have very much this attitude in our culture. You hear a lot about like, oh, we need like a moonshot. We need like some sort of Manhattan pro Like we have these big problems and we have to bring in all these experts from whatever fields to, to solve the problems. But like you say, you have a bunch of ex-addicts and ex-cons that get this award. And so I think sometimes it's, we got to rethink where genius really comes from, you know? Yeah. Like yeah. here you have this genius solution and it hasn't come from, you know, from on high. It's come from people that just have a reason to, to care, you know, and to, to find that solution. Well, it's so, a, a top-down um, problem that, that, that needs a bottom-up solution. What I, what I mean by yeah. a top-down problem is the problem is all the people making decisions have no idea what the true ex experiences are like. It's all policymaking. Mm. It's doctors. It's therapists. But it's not people who have lived it. And there's so yeah. much money in it that there's some there's – some, that piece is in there. The money piece is in there. And people don't want to change the policy because it's, it, it's, it's driven by a, a funding model. We need people making yeah. decisions that have been there and done that. They could talk about real life experiences and what work has worked for them. Yeah, absolutely. I guess one of the other things I wanted to ask about, now I'm, I'm kind of finding my notes here. Um, so yeah, I want to kind of talk about like what it is like. I've read something on the website about people from within the community that are not, don't have any sort of record, don't have issues with drugs that want to have an experience with Other Side Academy. Um, what sort of like... Um, things are you guys kind of evolving to allow people to understand what that experience is, even if they don't have kind of that, that record. If they just want to learn more about Tosa. Well, more than just learn about Tosa, like the idea that, you know, what if someone comes to the, the bench and they don't oh, okay. have drug issues, they don't have a record and they're just like, I just want to be a better person. Or I just like, this really appeals to me. I want this experience. I mean, is, is that something that, that there's room for there? Is that something that ever even happens? You know? Well, yeah. Here's the thing. So if someone isn't a drug addict and doesn't have that history, you're, I, the odds of someone coming to take a seat on the bench and putting their life on hold. But if someone came in mm. here, if you came in here, Brandon, you sat on the bench and said, listen, Dave, I'm not a drug addict or an alcoholic and I've never been arrested, but my life is chaotic because I don't know how to live it. I, these are all the mm. things, all the mistakes I've made. I'm going to interview you and see if we can help you. Because again, all yeah. we want to do is improve the human condition. If your current condition is is less than less than good and you're struggling in life and we can help you we will you won't see that much because people who are out there working paying their bills have families aren't going to put their life on hold to come do this for two and a half years mm -hmm. but to answer yeah. your question would i interview them you bet i would if they wanted to come spend a couple years here and be a student and be treated just like everybody else we'll have that conversation yeah so uh another thing i'd be interested in is is so what type of what type of applicants are not a good fit for for a model like this? So um, there's, I'm sure there's different different reasons why someone might not be a fit for the model. Sure. If you have any sex offenses whatsoever, if you have to register as a sex offender or you have sex crimes in your history and you don't have to register, we can't take you because that requires a different type of therapy. Uh, it's it's beyond our our scope of being able to help you. That's one of the things. Mm -hmm. If you have arson on your jacket, you're the kind of person who, when you get upset, you burn buildings down. That oh, requires a different, a different type of help. So sex crimes uh, and, and arson are two hard stops. And then dual diagnosis. But let's talk about that for a second. Dual diagnosis, people who require psychotropic medication or medication gotcha. for mental yeah. health issues. This is interesting because half of my students have been on medications before. You want to know why they're on medications? Because right. there's money in it. You show me oh, most, most of my students have suffered from two things, anxiety and depression. 
What, so I'll interview them and I'll go, are you on medication? Yeah, for what? Anxiety and depression. Brandon, show me a drug addict who's out there running the streets, stealing from mom and dad, breaking into people's homes, breaking into garages, on probation, running from the law that doesn't have anxiety. Then mm, they, yeah, then, they get, sure. then they get busted. They're in jail. Show me a drug addict who's in jail that doesn't suffer from depression. And what we want to do in jail is they go, here, take these three pills. You'll feel better. That's the worst thing you could possibly do. Now they're not going to feel yeah. their, their, their consequences. They have no idea how to deal with their emotions. And oftentimes when I'm doing an interview with somebody in jail, I'll go, so uh, taking any medications? Yeah. What are you taking? Zoloft, uh, whatever they name off a, a myriad of medications. Well, what was your diagnosis? Uh, anxiety and depression. Oh, so you're suffering from both of them? Mm -hmm. Do you need the medication? No. Then why are you taking it? Well, it helps me sleep. Or they'll answer, why, I'll say, why are you taking it? Well, I'm trading it. They use it for barter. They put it in their mouth. They cheek it. And then they pull it out. And they trade it for food. So those are the things that are going on. And what I use, I tell them, I say, well, you can't take that medication at the other side academy. Brandon, they go back to the same doctor and the doctor gives them a clean bill of health and a medical clearance <laughs> that they don't need the medication. Two weeks ago, the same doctor put them on it. What the hell are we doing? Sure. Yeah. That's what happens in the, in the jails. We're creating drug addicts in jail. Hmm. Now, how about when it gets to, to diagnosis, they're more like, like I think about something like like civil bipolar yes. or you have like schizophrenia, things yes. like that. Yeah, you're exactly What do you do right. when you run into things like that? People who have, who have been diagnosed with schizophrenia. Now I'm not a doctor, but I've done a thousand interviews, yeah. probably more than most doctors will in a lifetime. It's not hard to tell if somebody is suffering from those things. And then I'll dig it a little deeper and ask him, what is, what does that look like to you? What happens when you're on the street or in jail and they'll explain their symptoms and what they do. And then we know that they're not going to be a good fit particularly with the, the schizophrenia and things that are worse than that, uh, uh, personality disorder, multiple personalities, you know, and they'll explain that they've tried to commit suicide a number of times, or they've done this, or they've done that, or they're, you know, we just, we'll just dig in a little deeper and then we can determine whether or not they'd be a good fit. So, but I mean, it seems like there is for a very specific population, it seems like it's, it's a good fit, right? That it's like, okay, there's potential here. You know, there's a potential for some sort of stabilization yeah. then the process can work. For the for the yeah. for your drug addict who's been a drug addict for you know a year or twenty years who's out there committing crimes to support their habit regardless of what it is writing bad checks breaking into storages stealing from Home Depot and taking it back and dealing drugs and all the other myriad of things that they'll do to support their habit that's who we're looking for it's just the drug addict who's lost his way and has yeah. and has acquired yeah. all of those bad behaviors along the way. Yeah. Um, so I guess maybe, maybe to, to wrap up here, I think I'd be kind of interested in, in your thoughts on, on the, how much potential there is for, for this model to grow, like how much more good can this particular approach do? It, it's fascinating. It, like I said, our success rate for people who stay two and a half years or longer is upwards of 85% and four years or longer, it's a hundred percent. We haven't had anybody stay four years that's reoffended or started using again because the longer you're away from it, the better your odds. So if our success rate, drug-free, crime-free and employed is 85%, you know, the reason why we get some pushback from your, uh, your 30, 60, 90 day models is because we're taking their clients who are paid to go there. <laughs> that's the truth. Yeah. And then they'll go, well, you don't have yeah. any doctors or therapists there. Oh, and your way is working so well, right? I mean, that's, yeah. that, that's true. There's, uh, there's, there's many, many, many articles written, and there's a lot of uh, science behind the therapeutic community. It started over 50 years ago, but they're very mm. difficult to manage and very difficult to run. You have to have the right leadership. The entire country, we go all over the country and all over the world studying other therapeutic communities. We've gone to... Uh, the, uh, the Southeast Asia, we've gone to Bangkok and spoke at the therapeutic community, uh, world federation of therapeutic communities. We've gone to a program in Italy called San Patriano. That's been around for 50 years. There's 1400 students there. It's a four year program. We have visited all the other therapeutic communities in the United States. We're still finding a few on the fringes that we're going to go see. Matter of fact, we're going mm -hmm. to, uh, 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 to one here in Texas in a couple of weeks. So, uh, this model has a lot of merit and its, and its efficacy is really, really high. It's just very difficult to run because you have to find people who have been there and done it, come out the other side and want to commit to doing something like this. Yeah. We, we just opened up site two in Denver a year ago, May. We're heading to San Diego. 
San Diego, uh, they've, they've raised a considerable amount of money. They want us to bring the model there. They've, we've already found a property. We're probably a year and a half to two years out after the property gets hmm. uh, 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 purchased and we get the leadership team together. But we get calls almost daily from people all over the country that want us to bring this model to them because they know wow. it works. It's long. It's hard. It's extremely effective. It's free. It costs the taxpayer nothing. We've saved the taxpayer in the state of Utah in the five years that we've been here, uh, incarceration fees, arrest fees, court fees, over $50 million in five years. Holy smokes. That's a savings to the taxpayers. Sorry, just to go back a little bit. So when you go to these conferences, are you actively kind of looking at these other other in, you know instances of this model and saying, hey, what else can we learn? What else oh, yeah. can we add to what yeah. we're doing? Is that part yeah. of it? That's awesome. That's, that's exactly what we do. We go there and you know, we went to Habilitat in Hawaii that's been around for 50 years. And I went out and with Tim and we stayed there for a few days. And then we went out as a larger group and stayed for a week. We went to San Patriano mm. twice in Italy. And then me and Tim went out there and we stayed at the facility for a week and became like a student uh, immersion training. Yeah. So we could really learn. Yeah. And all we want to do is, what are you doing that's working? What are you doing that isn't? Next program. What are you doing? What are best practices? What are you guys <laughs> doing that we're not doing? Yeah. We want to learn. So we... We can bring all those practices back here and implement them here if they're working. I, I, this kind of feels like to me, like one of these things that, you know, any growth that's going to come, it's, it's going to kind of be slow, like kind of any good thing in this world, you know, it's, it kind of grows slowly, right? Yeah. It's not going to be something that's going to, you know, cover the country overnight. Unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, you got to do it. It's got to be done right. You know, it's, it's, you don't want it to be you know, mishandled and, and how it's, how it's spread out. I guess that's kind of maybe one little other thing to, to, to ask about is just this question of if you ever worry about kind of the institution eroding over time, and I don't mean so much like, like corruption necessarily, but like just kind of becoming more status quo and not really doing as much good as it used to do. Or, um, is that something that ever keeps you up at night? Like thinking, how can you maintain the, the kind of ethics of, of what you're doing, the kind of um, yeah. Yeah. Brandon, you ask great questions. We have a board here and we have our leadership team and we all hold each other accountable. And the fascinating thing, unlike most organizations, is games. We have to go too. Mm. So when, when we start slipping, <laughs> if I start slipping, yeah. believe me, the students are going to take me to a game. All of my staff yeah. are subject to the same scrutiny. It's unlike any other organization. Most organizations have it designed uh, so that you can't confront your leader or the, or the leader can't confront his leader. Most organizations are like that. Here is the complete opposite. You will get called on your behavior here. And that really yeah. will keep it from eroding because the erosion, usually by the time you notice it, something big has happened. But here, it's all the little things that lead up to that that'll get addressed well before it ever has a chance to erode. So you should, what, if you see the games disappear, that's when you should really start worrying. Of course. Yeah. If the games disappear, the house will, <laughs> the house will implode. Well, uh, Dave, I don't want to keep you any longer than I already have. Again, I, I really appreciate your your time you've taken to share this. I think this is um, something people need to know a lot more about. I'm very fascinated by it. And I think there's there's a lot to, to look at here for how we solve a lot of different problems in, yeah. in our society. So yeah, um, yeah thanks again. It's It's been an awesome conversation. Well, you're welcome. And Brandon, if you have more questions going forward or anybody that's listening to the podcast has any questions... They're free to reach out. Uh, they can call me directly or, or send an email at Dave at the Other Side Academy. We are an open book. We allow visitors to come, uh, tour the facility, sit down at lunch with the students, and they can ask the students anything they want. We're a completely open book, which is unlike a lot of other organizations. Have some fun. People who come here to visit leave better for it. Awesome. That's amazing. I, I should take you up on that sometime. I'm just, I'm just like down in Rose park. So I'm sure are you guys like up on, on like uh South temple or something. Is that yeah, we're right? Is? Yeah. We're, we're just South of South temple. We're at seventh East and first okay. South. I'd love to have you, Brandon. Awesome. Hey Dave, thanks again. It's been off, awesome conversation. You've been listening to how to be an artist to support this podcast. You can go to patreon.com forward slash H two B N a.